Many thanks, Philip, for the invitation. My name is uh, Simon Seiter. I'm head of digital assets at Deutsche Börse, and uh, they are trying to build an infrastructure for digital assets. And today, um, I want to focus in my talks about the digital euro and its impact on the securities trading side. And maybe not even from the perspective of uh, central bank digital currencies versus, versus commercial bank digital currencies, but instead, to be honest, the question I get the most and that you might also get if you are working in this space is maybe what, what is different with this kind of uh, new digital money and why do the current systems that we have and the current um, account keeping structures, which are already digital, why do they differ from, from the digital euro? And this is what I would like to point out really today and what impact this has on the security trade. And therefore, I would go a bit back actually in the development of money, so to say. So um, in first beginning, when there was literally no money, people just exchanged uh, commodities. Yeah, Something which was working to some extent, but if you think of the purpose of money, for, ex uh, for example, uh, a, a storage of value, a cow is maybe not the best way to do this because the cow will ultimately die and then your money is gone. So people started inventing money via trading other commodities with, that were working better. For example, gold, which was not dying, so you could reuse it. And then people started actually to coin this uh, gold into, into uh, physical money, as we still have today, by the way. Uh, but back then, there was also some real value behind it because it was coined in a material that had bared a value itself. So what you had what is what we today call actually a bearer instrument. The next evolution of money was that people didn't get the bearer itself, but something that was, and this is a very important step, referring to the value that is lying somewhere else. And why is this interesting? Because the paper money doesn't bear the value itself. And this is, by the way, very similar to securities. We'll come to that in a second. Of course, the paper itself is worth only a few cents. But if you print it in a very special way, it can be worth 500 euros, for example, or even up to really large sums in the US where there were special bills that were printed back in the history. So the very important distinction here is that they moved away from the underlying assets, that if you bear something, it really has a value, whatever it's being coined in a way. And now it was just a reference to a value that somebody else granted for, and this was the central bank. The central bank granted for the value that was being printed. And then we moved further on to an account keeping system of that value. So you didn't need to have the banknotes itself that were printed, but instead somebody just told you that you have some money on your accounts. And this was the function of the bank. And this is already kind of digital process for reference to a value that's lying somewhere else. But still, it's something that you can use to, to trade and to pay. And now comes something which is new, which is actually digital money. And I think now the, the question is, of course, how does digital money differ from the accounts? Because if you use, look at it from, a, from an end client perspective, from user perspective, he might have seen both values in a smartphone, whether it's a wallet or an account, maybe a regular user doesn't mind. And there's one difference. If you look from the chronology perspective for keeping reference, you have the banknotes, then the accounts, and then the digital money. But in terms of similarities, the order is different. Digital money is much closer to banknotes than to accounts. And I will come to that in a second, really to make this difference between these two approaches. Because what you hold in your wallet as digital money is actually the money. In your accounts, you only have a reference of somebody who counted money for you, the banknote, for example, is something where you really hold the banknote in your hands. And similarly, if you have the digital money on your wallet, on your smartphone or wherever, then you still hold the money with yourself. So this is the, the true difference. And if, to, to explain a bit further, I would try to come back to the, to the nature of the account. When you think about, um, and, and I will explain why this is important for the whole topic in a second, yeah? Uh, the nature of the account and of the accountant was the accountant is somebody who, call, uh, who, who uh, counted money for you. This was the purpose of the accountant. And in the beginning, the bank had accountants that did this manually. So they did manual book entries, which they wrote into their books, into their balance sheets. 
And then if you deducted some money from the bank, there was an update on the book and the accountant did that. It was a manual reference that was entered into the books. And this is a process of references to money, not money itself. And the accountant had the job, very important, of counting the money for you. That's the job of the accountant. And what we have done in the financial industry is we have to largest extent digitized the process of counting money and, by the way, of counting securities. So everything's being kept in accounts, which means nothing else than a process of counting these assets for you, not the transfer, actually, of these assets. And this is an important distinction I want to make. And if you only take this away from uh, today's presentation, I would be very happy because this will, uh, you will be faced in many discussions, this argument, we already have digital money, and this is not true. We have a digital process to count money, and this does not equal digital money. It's a completely different game. And to get this more abstract, we have created digital processes, and these digital processes are not digital products. And what we can achieve with DRT is actually that we digitize the project, product. And this is our ambition at, at Deutsche Börse. And now I want to show you how this impacts the security trading. If you really try to simplify security trading, then you have a security that's been issued. By the way, it just has this value also because uh, there was a special process of signing the document. The paper of the document itself is also only worth some sense, but it gets valuable because somebody signed it. And then you have money. And the idea of securities trading is actually that you exchange, for most cases, the security with the money. Very simplified view, but that's actually how we assume securities trading to work. And if you have a physical security and physical money, what you can do is actually directly exchange this. And this is why this kind of business, exchanging money and security, was called a delivery versus payment transaction, because you actually deliver the security and you pay for it. That's the idea. And there's a German word for it, which I like very much, which is called, and sorry for the English speaking people, I'll try to explain, uh, Zug und Zuggeschäft. So it's a real time transaction, I would call it like that. And the funny thing is, now let's look a bit into the more of the truth, how currently securities trading works. Because actually, it rather looks like this. And this is still a simplified view. And what you can see here is the effect of the account onto the process of buying securities. And that we've actually moved away from the idea of delivery versus payment. When you look at this picture, it's completely different to the one before. Where is the digital security. The digital security you can see right in the middle and the digital security, and that's a fun fact, will not move along the whole transaction. And that's why it like, only has one arrow going up. The digital secu the security is today being issued to a large extent as a physical global node. So, so if you think that uh, when you trade a security uh, in your bank account that this is all digital, this is not true. You still have a physical global node, and this physical global node is sitting in a vault, in a physical vault. There are people with machine guns that protect this vault because the security inside are after so-called in-rem law, really the security. And who owns the security has the value of the security, similar to uh, paper-based money, for example. And now this, this vault is being operated by somebody that is enabling the trading of these securities in a more digital process. And this is actually what a CSD is called, a central security depository, as the name says. Security is being stored centrally, but then the access is opened up by connecting to many, many different financial institutions. That's the purpose of the, of the CSD that's often argued, and uh, which is also part of our business at Deutsche Börse Group within the entity of Clearstream. So the idea is that, of course, if you would need a physical delivery of securities every time you buy a security, this would take much time because you cannot obviously physically deliver these securities. And due to the fact that they are, however, physically, what you do is you build up accounts that refer to the security. This is why you have a global node. The global node is representing all the value that one security issuance represents. And then you can uh, 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 book pieces of these uh, security into accounts. And this is what Clearstream does. And Clearstream does this for, for banks. 
So there are banks inside that are financial institutions and then connect to Clearstream. And the idea of this approach is to enable a scalable trading because uh, this, this enables that they can connect to many, many different countries by connecting only to a few institutions, so to say. So the, 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 our client base is, is, is much more focused on institutional clients. We do not have retail clients on our side. And then, but of course, if we book this onto the accounts of our clients, and these clients are financial institutions, they have accounting systems themselves. And even it, often it's not the case that there's like only one bank in between, or there's, there's directly one bank connected that is connected to the retail client, but there are even some banks inside that also provide a certain mechanism of scalability via uh, connecting to then many more different smaller banks. So what you often have is not only like one account keeping system of the security, but you additionally have at least one or two accounting systems of the, of the securities on the one side and the money on the other side. So you ultimately have up to, let's say, five uh, account systems. And what are these account systems doing? I'm coming back now to the history of the accountant. The purpose of the accounting system is um, to count the money or to count the securities. In a, in a yes digital way but everyone has to do that on their own so imagine like digital accountants sitting on top of each bank which have to collect and count the money and this means ultimately that there are processes which take time and often these bank systems of course work in batch processes and this is the reason why this takes some time in terms of regularly two days for a settlement of security and we still talk here about a dvp well, quite obviously, it's not a DVP anymore. Now, many people think we can solve this problem by doing this, because it seems so obvious, right? Now it's going back to the picture before to some extent, and we could believe, why not, if we have the digital money and the digital security, remove everything inside, and then just bilaterally via a technical mechanism exchange. Technically, of course, possible. But there are some questions that arise, and I think that can hardly be answered. Because the, 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 the purpose of these institutions is not only to have somebody who, owns a, uh, who, who earns a lot of money and then has a nice life. That's not the purpose of the bank. Yeah? The purpose is to provide um, uh, market mechanisms and financial market institutions even more to create safe and trusted markets that avoid certain problems that have occurred over time. And if you think of direct trading, you can think even of movies like Wolf of Wall Street, where they sold like small bonds to private clients directly. This was like only one intermediary. And the people just didn't get what they buy. And it will be very similar if we organize a market in the same way. So, for example, who avoids information asymmetries? We have seen this. Telegram groups for pump and dump. This is not really how efficient market works. Who can guarantee if there's a technical error, even on the customer level? Who does still protect investors, so inform about assets and risks? Who is caring about avoiding terror financing? Who is taking care for fair pricing mechanisms? It's not the technology that will provide it automatically. And who is making sure that all these kind of technological pieces out there also connect with each other in a way that they are scalable and do not lead to technical fragmentation? So what we propose, this is something that I've shown previously, but I'm coming back now to this also from the money perspective. We think that there is a need for a digital asset infrastructure that still keeps the obligations and duties within some institutions but we definitely see that our role as a CSD and Clearstream will change. And how does this change? You can see here what we call, yes, a digital security depository. So something where we enable our clients to issue their products as natively digital products. So this is not anymore about having references to something. What is being issued in this network of financial institutions is really a digital security and digital money. What kind of, let's see, maybe digital commercial bank money, maybe digital central bank money, we will see. But it's a natively digital asset that's being issued onto there. And then this enables a truly DVP. And what we will enable when you come back to the picture before is that in the back office, there is a direct connection possible between two end clients. So it's possible that if somebody buys a security from someone else, they'll have individual nodes on this network, but these nodes are being managed by their respective financial institution. And we try to make sure that the network is protected, safe, and also regulatory compliant. And if these two nodes then are reconciled with the bank accounts, then this accountant function gets somehow obsolete because it's actually being leveraged onto the ledger. 
And this enables then these two people to directly interact with other, but still keep the obligations of scalable capital markets uh, by the financial institutions. So they can have a true DVP because the digital security is being directly exchanged with the digital money. This is possible within this network, but you still have the customer contact as is. And this is also something that we see as a goal, because by the way, somebody who's like a regular person and not a very fancy crypto aficionado, he will not go and buy a, and download a separate app to buy this, but he wants this in his bank account ultimately. So we enable the direct interaction in the back office, but in the front office, we still keep the same distribution channels. And if you're interested into that, I would be very happy to have a talk with you and to collaborate. Many thanks.